I wanted to give uh, a lecture about someone who doesn't get any respect, even though he was the world champion. It's tough around here. And his name was Max Uwe, or Uwe. And if you live in Holland, I don't want to hear your comments on Twitter or, or on YouTube. Like, I can pronounce it, I just don't want to pronounce it right, because we're in America here. So it's Max U. You happy now? His name was spelled E-U-W-E. -E. His first name wasn't even Max. It was Max Hilges, which no American pronounced except me. So you better be happy in Holland right now. Uh, he was a Dutch player, and he became world champion basically due to a drinking problem, a drinking problem of his opponent. So uh, one of the most suspicious world champions ever was Alexander Aljokin, or Alekine if you're American. And he was an okay player. He was at least expert strength, at least. Right, you agree with that, at least. And uh, Capablanca, who beat everybody for years and years and years, he was like, oh boy, I'm gonna play an Alekine kind of match. What an easy opponent. And so he was basically, you know, drinking and staying out all night, and Alekine was preparing for the match. Alekine won the match, and then never would play Capablanca again. Because of Alyekin's shenanigans, we now have rules. If you become the world champion, you have to play other people who are strong to retain your title, okay? And Alekine is like, I'm not playing Capablanca, he'll beat me. So instead he played people that couldn't possibly beat him, uh, or so he thought. And then he played Max Uwe, who, well, really couldn't beat him, but Al Yekin was occasionally drinking when he was awake, and Max Uwe won a match against him, and unlike Alekine, he gave him a rematch, Alekine decided to win that match. So uh, Max Uwe was the world chess champion, and he was also two other things that no world champion has accomplished or ever will. He was the world amateur champion, which I don't know if that exists anymore, it might. And he was also the FIDE president. He was the president of chess. Um, okay, that was later, of course. In fact, I believe when Bobby Fischer became the world champion, he received his crown from Max Erva, from a previous world champion. That sounds like a good idea. Okay, so I wanna show games that Erva won against famous players and also against his countrymen, the Dutch players, because he was Dutch. Um, now, the first game, is against Richard Rady, who was a great player. I think I did a Legends on him before. Okay, cool. And in this position, although Bishop e5 is a very strong move, black is in check, and black decided to not be in check and played king a7. Now actually, uh, the best move here is shocking, and Rady didn't uh, Irva didn't play it. Irva played a more shocking move than the shocking winning move. The best move is actually to attempt to put black in check on this diagonal because that would be very close to checkmate. And if you play bishop d4 check, which looks pretty good, black can just take it. And so the best move for white is actually bishop to c1, which is a funny retreat. And we're gonna play bishop e3 check and the computer says there's no defense. Bishop e3 check is, is gonna be checkmate. And luckily, Irva didn't play that. He played much more enterprisingly, and it was also quite good. He played rook to d8, which gives his rook away. On the other hand, if black doesn't take this rook, rook a8 is checkmate. And black didn't want to get checkmated. So he played b6. Now let's take the rook and see what happens. Although he didn't take the rook. Now, earlier in my discussion, I said if the bishop goes to d4 check, the black knight will take it. Well, guess what? The black knight's not there. So now bishop d4 check, check is very hard to meet. Bishop check. Uh, if you play b6, I fork your king and queen. I just did a class on forks. And if you retreat, there's a retreat, then bishop b6 is hard to meet really hard to meet. Okay, um, and knight b6 check and so forth. So he didn't play knight takes rook, he played b6, which is good because now white sacrificed more rooks. Played bishop a3, again sacrificing his rook. If knight takes rook, rook to e7, and the king and queen are lined up, the bishop is protecting the rook. 
So he played pawn takes pawn check, and white got out of check. Very nice. Then he played queen f7, because he wants to get his queen down here and check the white king, and probably that would be pretty good for black. Rook e7 check, attacking the king and the queen. So this is the third rook sacrifice that white has made in four moves. He's going for the record. Well, you have to take the rook. There's no other legal moves. So he took the rook. Rook d7 check. The king moved to the back rank because it has to. And then the knight came in with check. And the bishop came in with mate. And Morphy would be proud because white used all three of his pieces to give checkmate. They're all doing a good job. And when you attack your opponent with several pieces, you're much more likely to be successful. And Irva was actually quite a good attacking player, as we're going to see later in his game with Fisher. Irva was well known as an openings theoretician. He would study the opening and then play what he studied at home. And in those days, we didn't have the internet and we didn't have thousands and thousands and thousands of chess books. So basically, the magazine articles and the books were written by Irva. He liked to study the opening and give his opinion on matters. Some of those opinions weren't, weren't too good. Um, and he was a great attacking player also, beating famous Richard Rady, who we did a lecture on earlier. Now, the next two games are against Dutch players that nobody's heard of, um, except Dutch people who were alive 100 years ago. And even then, right. now, this is a game that he played in a match. Irva actually played a lot of matches with people from his home country to see who was the best player in the Netherlands. Since he was the world champion later, I guess it was him. Okay. Now, in this position, uh, White's king is very suspicious in the corner here. And so Irva wanted to checkmate the king. And, he, and after the move rook e2, which is the losing move, he played knight g3 check. Uh, Arjun. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna that. Knight g3 check, good move. Now you're forking the king and the rook. Now, back in 1920, there weren't too many chess computers. Right, Arjun? So sometimes people made mistakes and we didn't know about it for years later. In this position, white has two possible moves. Pawn takes knight and king to g1. Those are the only moves that escape check. And usually when you have two legal moves, you play the right one. And if you even don't know the rules of chess and you make a move that's legal, you'll be right half the time. Uh, unfortunately, White didn't do that here. Question? Uh, since this is a Legends class, tell us about Bobby Fisher. What made him so great? Well, obviously well, this is a Legends class about a particular legend. Oh, okay. Very specific. Um, Fisher was more crazy than great, but he was good at both. He was very talented. In fact, we're going to look at a Fisher game later, so we'll talk about him. This class is only about Max Hervé, the famous world champion from the 1930s. Uh, he's a legend. Some of the chess players of the chess club here are also legends. Right, Arjun? Legends in their own mind. Arjun's like, what? Okay, so, no, in this class, though, we talk about one legend in particular, and we show his greatest games, and then we're like, man, his opponents weren't too good. Okay. Now, in this position, White should have played king g1, but he took the knight, which was a fatal opening of his king. And so Black decided that checkmating his opponent was a good idea. So he made the longest move you could imagine, queen h5. That's a pretty long move. White made the shortest move, right? His king is in check, so he played king g1. Pawn takes pawn. Now Black is threatening checkmate. And if White makes a nothing move, let's say rook a1, then we go queen check and checkmate. The reason it's checkmate is white's own rook is blocking the escape of his king. Okay, so white saw that and he moved his rook. Rook takes pawn. And then there was a lot of checks, lots of checks, more checks, lots of checks. 
Okay, and now black played the move pawn to g2. And we were actually talking about the pawn in the previous lecture. We were talking about how pawns can turn into queens. That would be good because then you'd win. So if, white, if black gets that pawn to the back row, that pawn will promote to a queen. Uh, black didn't, or white I should say, didn't want that to happen. So white played queen to g4. And if black promotes to a queen, white will just take it. So black did something very sneaky. Black played the move knight to d3 check. Very good move. It's check, and the king has nowhere to go. Now, if this was a scholastic tournament, black would probably say checkmate, and white would say OK. But these are, this is the former world champion, so they actually can make legal moves. It's amazing. So white is not in checkmate, even though white can't move his king, because white can capture the knight with his rook. Now, let's see who's paying the most attention. Black has checkmate in one move, recommended by me. If you checkmate your opponent, you win. Right, Arjun? So who, other than Arjun, who can find checkmate in one move? I can, because I already saw the game. Otherwise, I'd have no chance. All right, Arjun. Um, bishop F2. Bishop F2, checkmate. The bishop attacks the king, and the black queen is protecting the bishop, and the king has nowhere to go. Now, actually, that was a good decoy. The bishop wants to jump over the rook, but that's not allowed in the chess rules. So we play check, making the rook move away, and then checkmate. You don't mess with Max Irva. Although, I don't know, he's Dutch, so you can mess with him a little. All right, so that was a nice victory by the former world champion. Here's another game against a lesser known player. Irva was white. And this is something I tell my students not to do, but he wasn't my student, so it's okay if he does it. Black played the move c5. c5 is nothing to sneeze at. c5 attacking the bishop. I tell my students, when somebody attacks your bishop, move it away. But he wasn't my student, and I wasn't alive yet, so he has a good excuse. And he didn't move his bishop away. He sacrificed his bishop because he did a counterattack. Sometimes counterattack works, sometimes they don't. White played knight to d5. The knight is attacking the bishop. If the bishop moves away, let's say to d8, then this pawn is free. The pawn wasn't free last move because the black bishop was protecting it. So knight d5 is quite a good move. And they traded bishops. Black took white's bishop and white took black's bishop. Now black is in check. So he moved his king. And white was very greedy and took the pawn on f7. And white's a pawn ahead. The reason black can't capture the bishop is the white rook is protecting it. Now, when I play chess, and it's move 20 or so, I think it's about move 20 here, I try not to have all my pieces on the back row. That's not good development. OK, so black played knight c7, got his piece off the back row. And as most of you know, the best way to win at chess is to checkmate your opponent. In this game, white knew that, but black didn't know that. But black had a good excuse. It was 1920. Maybe he didn't know what checkmate was yet. And white played rook to f4, which is a very sneaky move because it looks like it's threatening this pawn. The reason it looks like it's threatening the pawn is because it's threatening the pawn. But actually, white has a bigger threat. And I think black didn't see the bigger threat. He just played the move bishop to e6, attacking this bishop. He's like, you can't take my pawn. I'm going to take your bishop. And for some reason, Arjun's hand isn't way up in the air, jumping up and down, screaming. Yeah, that's better. OK, so in this position, what move did white make, which led to a two-move checkmate? Checkmate's good, because then you win. Also, if you were here last week in my beginner's class, 
I showed two move checkmates. I didn't show this one, but here's one. And every move is check, making the first move easy to find because white only has one check. Right, Ben Simon? Absolutely. See? I've been looking all the time. Yeah. Now, some of you at home are very confused. Not because of the lecture, you were confused before the lecture. You're confused because I'm not calling on Julian, I'm not making fun of Julian, Julian's not screaming out, but there's a good reason Julian is playing in the World Open in Washington, D.C. And by the time you watch this video, it'll probably be next year's World Open, but that's not the point. I'm not the one on trial here, Ben Simon is. But give Ben Simon a break, he hasn't been paid in two months. <laughs> okay, and the main, he has, a good, he has a good reason he didn't know that the person who is his supervisor hasn't worked for two months for the chess club. Also, his supervisor doesn't know that. And what's funny about all those things I said is they're all true. But that's how everyone's like, yeah, those are all true. Everything he said was true. All right. Yeah, so when your supervisor doesn't work anymore and you're emailing them, it doesn't, doesn't really help. Okay. Anyway, uh, Arjun, you have to go to the bathroom. We have the right answer. He's like... Yeah, so white played knight g6 check. Notice how it's check. And when you're in check, you need to get out of check. And uh, you have to take the knight and then rook h4 checkmate. This was a very nice trick. It looked like the rook was attacking the pawn, but Irva just wanted to checkmate his opponent. Not very nice of him, but who said world champions were nice? If you've met Gary Kasparov, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, now we'll get to the big boys. Okay, I'm not saying they were overweight, but okay. Now, most people who play chess are not on stamps, and they're not on the money, right? So I have some money on me now. Let me see here. No, 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 no. All right, now on our money, which person on the money is in the World Chess Hall of Fame? for his chess contributions. You, wait, first of all, who told you? Okay, Benjamin Franklin is on the $100 bill and he's also in the US Chess Hall of Fame. In general, strong chess players aren't on the money. He's not on the money for his chess ability, tr trust me. Okay, however, in this game, black was Paul Carez. Probably we should do a Legends on him. Do we do one yet? Check, check the files. Uh, Paul Carez, many consider the greatest player never to be world champion. Many think that. Now he was black against Max Irva, many consider the weakest world champion. Now to tell you a funny story, because I like stories. When I lived in Belgium, before all of you were born, a friend of mine in the Netherlands was playing Trivial Pursuit, the Dutch version. Okay, so the questions are like, how come nobody knows what the Netherlands is? Okay, that's those are the kind of questions they get. Okay, how come nobody cares about the Netherlands? Why, why are we such a silly country? Those are the main questions. One of the questions was, who is the greatest chess player ever from the Netherlands? And these guys were chess players. And you would think, since this guy was the world champion, that would be a good answer. That was their answer, and the back of the card said Jan Timon. So, they had a lot of Timon fans. Jan Timon was a good chess player, he never world champion. So. Okay, so here we have the weakest world champion versus the strongest never to be world champion. What a, what a game. Okay, and they played as boring as possible. Okay, same, it's the same position. What's wrong with them? Okay, well this is 1939. Now, Black played a move, which I talked about in an earlier class. He pinned the knight. Now the knight can't move. Okay, Bob Seeger wasn't alive yet. He didn't know it was funny how the knight moves. Right, Alex? Yes, of course. Can you edit that out? Because terrible timing on his part. Okay, so Irva played e3, and Paul Carez played knight e4, which is a really mean move, attacking the knight twice. And I turned the volume off so I can try to play this move, but it won't let me do it. I'm trying, but the queen would then take the king. And again, most of you weren't here for the beginner class. Some of you were. When I say most of you, I think half of you were. Uh, if you're playing in real life, 
you can make lots of illegal moves, especially those guys who are sitting outside now. And if nobody notices, then nobody notices. If you're playing on the internet or on a computer, it won't let you make illegal moves. So that's a little bit different. OK, so the opening wasn't very interesting to me. It was the middle game that was interesting. OK. And something very interesting happened by Irva. And I thought I actually cut off most of the game, but all right. We'll get to the position that I'm interested in. Now, in the previous games we looked at, before our, our second in command showed up over here, Irva was checkmating everybody and sacking all his pieces and playing for me. And that's one of the things he was known for as a great attacking player and also known for his opening theory. Now, this game, Irva's been winning with white. He has two pawns in the center. And if you count the pawns, you'll notice that white is a pawn ahead. White has seven pawns. Black has six pawns. White is attacking black's king. White has the center. That's why he was the world champion. He played rook g3, getting more pieces into the attack. But Keres was not a bad player. And one of the things I said earlier, most chess players aren't on the money. If you go to Estonia, anybody been to Estonia? Anyone? Been to Estonia? On the five crown note, there's a picture of Keres. Yeah, he's on the money. Yeah. OK, so he's highly thought of in Estonia. I actually have one of the bills, but I don't know where it is. OK. All right, King H8, Knight takes G7. OK, Irva likes to play for attack and play for checkmate. And he only did so when he thought he was right, when he was accurate. Queen takes E4. Let's see what happens on Rook takes Knight. That looks safe. That didn't look too safe. OK, so we trade rooks and play queen e7 check. Now, these pieces are doing a good job defending, or perhaps I'm kidding. Perhaps. So usually, when you have a lot of pieces attacking, you don't have to give checkmate right away. For example, I don't have to give checkmate. I could threaten checkmate if I want, but I could also just take this pawn, or I could do that. Well, I didn't think I could do that. OK, that was, uh, that was further back than we usually go when the thing messes up. I blame Mike Comer. Why do I blame Mike Comer? He's not here. OK, so rook takes knight is too dangerous. Kara has played queen takes e4. Now he's threatening everything. And he took a pawn. OK, knight went back to h5, defending everything. And I actually just wanted to get to one position but I think I, I started too early. OK. And th this is the position I wanted, where white plays the move queen to d8. Now, occasionally, when you're in a chess database, you'll see an error. If you don't know it's an error, you will be confused for the rest of your life. And I got to tell you a story. When I lived in Michigan, I got a letter in the mail. And I could actually give a lecture about what that is to you kids out there. But I got a letter in the mail. And it said, Dear Mr. Feingold, I immediately threw the letter out, because I was called Mr. A year later, I got another letter. Dear Grandmaster Feingold, now I finally read it. And it, said, and it was a check enclosed, so then I continued to read. And it said, in this game, this guy against this guy, Capablanca said, this is an easy win. I leave it for the reader to decide. I've been looking at it for 50 years, and I can't find the win. 50 years. He's been looking at it. So I said, yeah, there is no win. Cat Blank is crazy. And he was like, OK, great. He thought maybe there was something wrong with him. OK, he leaves it to the reader to find the win that doesn't exist. OK, Cat Blank has showed him. So in the game in question, white played queen to d8, and the commentator put question mark, and then put black resigns. So does anybody know why that happened? Yeah, they meant exclaim and they put question mark and nobody corrected it. Yeah, you're like, question mark, what a terrible move. Now, first of all, rook takes queen's not a good move because rook takes rook is going to be mate. But I don't care about that. 
What I care about is, what is white threatening? Let's pretend black played the brilliant a5 going for a queen. What, why did white play queen d8? Argy, you know where the bathroom is? Yeah. All right, you. Rook g8 check, rook g, and that's an x-ray checkmate. Okay, and after, after queen d8, since that checkmate is threatened, uh, yeah, there's a lot of defenses to that. If you see one, let me know. Uh, uh, black resigned in this position after queen d8. But yeah, Irma was a brilliant attacking player, and he even beat the likes of Paul Keres. Of course, well, this knight is far superior to this bishop. Just don't tell my private students that. Because queen and bishop is better. Okay, and um, well, much to the chagrin of the lady who was here earlier, who wanted to talk about Fisher. Now we're gonna talk about Fisher, but she left. So she's gonna miss all the great commentary about Fisher. Okay, now uh, uh, Fisher and Urba didn't play very often for obvious reasons, right, right Arjun? Okay, uh, Fisher was playing chess between 1956 and 1972, and Irva was not. But okay, Irva played a little bit. All right, so this was at the end of Irva's career, at the beginning of Fisher's career. They played in 1957, and to shock you even more, this was a match. Irva played a lot of matches, okay? And, um, you know, a prelude of things to come when, when Irva would crown Fisher world champion. Okay, so uh, Irva was white, and this has one of my favorite moves ever in, in a chess game. That's why I like to show it. Also, beating Fisher is pretty good. Okay, they play the exchange QGD, and Fisher plays bishop b4. The rag goes in, which is very complicated. I would play bishop e7 and lose in calm fashion. Bishop b4 is a little more exciting. Uh, While well, this is very popular in Grandmaster play today, h6. Bishop b4 pins the knight on c3. N nothing. I want to say worst class ever, but you're sort of average. Well, bishop e7 is very meek. Black wants to play h6, g5, knight e4, queen a5, as we saw in the previous game when Irva was white. So the long-term goal, attack the bishop, play n or play the drunken knight takes d4. Knight e4 attacking, c5, queen a5, putting tremendous pressure. Black pinned, white pinned black's knight, so black gets to pin white's knight. And also there's a big fight for e4, so by pinning the knight, we get some control of e4. Of course, the other common moves are bishop e7 and c6. I myself have never played bishop e4, but I faced it many times. I always play the most calm, boring way possible. I don't want to get in any trouble or nothing. In fact, if I was white, I could even play queen c2, transposing to the queen c2 Nimzo Indian, uh, a variation where black plays d5 early. Although queen c2 doesn't do a lot to develop your king side. Some super grandmasters will play queen a4 check. Now, if they were playing players in this class, they would definitely play queen a4 check because some percentage of you would lose a piece here. I wonder what percentage, 50? Yeah. Right, Arjun? One. One percent? Yeah. I'm not sure if there is one percent, but. Like, I mean, less than 1%. Less than one percent in this class? Man, you gotta come to class for. Okay, so black has to play knight c6 defending his bishop, but now he's blocking his c-pawn. So some grandmasters will do this also. That help your question? Yes. Your your fake question? I mean, yeah. It's always funny to me that people complain about the queen's game of decline and they don't. They can just play bishop before and transpose the rogue zone rather than playing really passively and giving white the you know, the e3 f3 five. So you like bishop before? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I admit if I'm white, I'd rather face bishop e7. Yeah. Okay. So e3 h6 c5. Here comes queen a5 knight e4 g5. What will Irva do? Bishop to d3. Now remember, this game was played in 1957, so you can't say, why didn't he play Aronian's move against Anand? Because, you know, that was 2012. Yeah. And players now who analyze these positions have their computers do it while they're asleep. 
So players back here, they had to analyze it on their own, and if their conclusions were wrong, such as the famous, you know, Botvinnik Fisher game, which you're all aware of, where a guy analyzed something for weeks and his conclusion was wrong, he's like, oh yeah, I'm winning here, I analyzed this. And then Fisher made a move and he's worse. So. Okay, so in this position, I'm sure it's theory today, but okay, in 1957, we probably learned from this game and decided to play better. Fisher played knight c6, which I'm sure is reasonable, knight e2. And I like to play knight e2 if I can, instead of knight f3, when my opponent plays bishop to b4, because they're putting pressure on my knight, and now my knight is not only developed, but it's protecting my knight. And if I put my knight on f3, for example, black could pin both of my knights, and then he has pressure on my pawn on d4, since my knight on f3 is pinned. So I would prefer to play knight e2 if I can, and so he did. C takes d4, probably a move that wouldn't be played today. Uh, and again, white wanted to keep you know, c3, so he took with the pawn. Knight takes d4 is more interesting. This is a little more, looks like a symmetrical pawn structure might be a draw. But white has some advantage here, I think, because the bishop on d3 is very strong. And I don't think black wants to trade off his bishop here. He's probably just going to retreat it later and lose a tempo and try to claim the knight on e2 is passive. Pretty good claim. Okay, castles, castles, everybody's happy. Now, again, let's be nice to Fisher, and I'm never nice to Fisher, but let's be nice to him anyway. How old was Fisher in 1957? 14 at the oldest. Could have been 13, although he's born in March, so probably not. Okay, so Fisher at 14 is playing a former world champion. I mean, and he hadn't become fully crazy yet. He was working on it. So probably, imagine if you were 14, which I guess Arjun hasn't happened yet, and you're playing a world champion, you may be slightly nervous. Maybe. Maybe not. Okay, bishop e6, very passive blocks the e-file. Lisa Simpson wouldn't like this bishop, it's blockaded. But Simpsons were not 1957. I think the series started in 58, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Bishop to c2, this is a typical move of a lower rated player. Um, except when it works, then it's a grandmaster move. Okay, and you know, white wants to play queen d3 and give him the old queen h7. Okay, seems like a good idea, right? Okay, so bishop goes back to e7, because queen d3 and bishop takes f6 and then mate. So knight f4. If we play queen d3 now, what does black do to rebuff such a move? Making it look quite silly. I, nobody's raising their hand, so I'll call on you at home. You, yeah, you. No, no, that's wrong. Terrible. All right, how about somebody here? How does white get punished for his indolence playing queen d3 too early? Anyone? Arjun's not even looking. Too easy? No. Somebody quietly said knight b4. Sounded like Danny whispering. Yeah. Knight to b4, and then that mate doesn't work because we take your queen. And then you gotta move your queen because your queen's attacked, I take your bishop. So queen d3 doesn't work. Queen d3 would have worked here, but black played bishop e7. So Fisher was pretty good. Okay, knight f4, that'll show that guy that played bishop e6. Queen b6, bishop takes f6, with the idea of queen d3, obviously. And now, most of us can see the threat. Now, when white played knight f4, he was thinking, when I play queen to d3, I can try to play queen h7 mate. The normal defense is g6. And now, white has a pleasant choice of taking this or taking this. I would take this, because it's more pleasant. Okay, so Fisher played rook f to d8 and said, check me, I dare you, I double dare you. And then later he sued Quentin Tarantino, among with many other people. 
rook to e1, I'll play queen h7 when I feel like it. First, I'm going to make sure your king can't run away. Again, g6 runs into not only knight takes e6, but rook takes e6. Ben, I've got a bad question. Yes, sir. Then you want to play knight to b4. And then take back on e6. With the queen. With the queen makes sense. I want to play knight d5, but I feel like I'm too old to play that. Arjun, could you suggest knight d5, please? Knight d5. Oh, Arjun said knight d5. Let's look at it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <sighs> Well, if you take my knight, I, I think I'm ahead of material. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think knight d5 works. I hate to admit it. Thanks, Sergeant. Good job. Nice. Yeah. What did you want to play here with black? Um, oh, okay. So you don't like this for either. Yeah, it seems like here black is down a piece and has three pieces attacked. That's probably not a good sign. <laughs> probably when you're down a piece, you shouldn't have three pieces attacked when two of them are rooks. Okay, so instead of g6, rook fd8, Irv is in no hurry, rook e1, knight to b4 attacking the queen, forcing queen h7, he showed him. Okay, and now this is one of my favorite moves in chess history, which shows you what kind of life I've led. Knight g6 is way too exciting for me. Indeed. The greatest move I've ever seen. No. Okay, so black will play king e7 after queen h8 unless you don't let him play king e7. True story, right? Somebody suggested knight g6, which does prevent king to e7, although the knight is hanging. Uh, remember, white played knight f4 earlier. So the knight on f4 and the knight on c3 working together can go to d5, preventing king e7, followed by mate. However, black has a thousand pieces defending d5. So if I take on d5 and take on d5, then, you know, you take it on d5. Okay. So we have to eliminate one of black's defenders of d5. So now Marler knows the answer. No? I thought I gave away with that explanation. Arjun. A3. A3. Very good. That's one of my favorite moves. It attacks the knight, and when the knight moves away, I'm going to play knight takes d5 and checkmate you. Don't you hate when that happens? And on the other hand, if you don't move your knight away, I'm going to take it. So a3 sort of hits him where it hurts. Knight takes bishop. Obviously, Fisher expected queen takes knight. And then knight takes d5. Now, not only... Yeah, he's sleeping before. Yeah. Not only is white threatening queen h8 mate, but as somebody in Michigan once told me, white has an even better threat, knight takes queen. I had a player in Michigan tell me taking a queen was better than mate, so I'll give him his kudos here. Well, knight takes queen is annoying, and queen h8 is annoying. Unfortunately, the bishop on e6 can't take the knight because then the white rook is stopping the king from escaping. Rook takes, knight takes. And even when you're 14 years old, you have to resign here. Because your queen is hanging, you're getting checkmated, and as kids in my kids class would point out, your knight is hanging. Not sure why they would point that out, but they would. Yeah. But the fact that queen h8 is mate and knight takes queen wins a queen. Pretty good for Irva, you know, 20 years after he was world champion. When I say 20, more than that. So Irva's still playing good chess, beating a young Bobby Fischer, this game was played a year after the game of the century, which was what game? I thought you'd all say it in unison. 
Game of the century. You. Burn, Which burn? Robert. You're so close. He's like 50-50. No, that was a better game, but Donald Byrne, Bobby Fischer, 1956, is the famous game where Fischer sacrifices his queen. Fischer could also sacrifice his queen here, but he didn't mean it. So that's, that's different when you mean it, you don't mean it. So yeah, A3, a brilliant move by Irva, later becoming the FIDE president and a great world champion, a great chess player, great theoretician, underrated player in my opinion. Maybe he was the weakest world champion, but if, if I become world champion, I'll be the weakest, then he won't be so famous. So you better hope I don't become world champion. He has nothing to worry about, right Arjun? Yeah. Exactly. I hope you learned a lot, I know I did, and let's, let's praise Max Irva, not only for his great chess, but for his very difficult name to pronounce. Mm -hmm.